Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dong Ming Lai. I'm from the Department for Pancreas and Medical and Molecular Genetics. This is done by Yung Long, it's not my problem. Uh, I'm going to talk about the um, statistical genetics and its application in uh, next generation sequencing data. And uh, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about today. It's not uh, yeah, just for uh, NGS data. You can use whatever, any you know, the, um, uh, genetic data. You don't just want me you know, to be as inclusive and possible. So there will be tons of information here. And then right now, I don't think you need to memorize everything. Just uh, focus and listen. And if there's anything in your quiz or test, uh, I, I will let you know, you know the which slide uh, you should uh, you know, the focus on. So the genetic analysis is uh, just uh, looking for uh, genetic variants uh, slash genes uh, responsible for a disease or trade. And to be exact, you know, for any genetic analysis, you know, the first step, you are always looking for a genetic variance, not particular genes. Then after you find a genetic variance, then you link their functions to a gene. And uh, you know the the reason I put a disease slash trait over there is because of, you know the, when you are talking about the disease, it's always a binary. Okay, you have this disease or not. But if you are talking about trait, it uh, could be you know the binary. It uh, also um, uh, uh, can be you know the continuous uh, trait, like for example you know the for the hypertension, if your blood pressure you know the larger than one hundred forty, you have hypertension, yes or no, and uh, you know the you can use you know blood pressure directly, and then uh, you like, you know we are talking about the two types of disease or trait, the first one is the Mendelian disease, and also called you know the you have named single gene disease, and the complex trait. And then some people use complex disease, a complex, you know, the, oh, I changed the, yeah, a common disease. So this is a comparison of these uh, two types of disease. For Mendelian disease, you know, it's usually rare, run into, you know, the one or just the several big pedigrees. And because, you know, the, you know, uh, these pedigrees are bigger, you can clearly see their Mendelian inheritance pattern, like dominant, recessive, and these are usually caused by, you know, the one variant, or maybe multiple variants in one gene. And this uh, variant or gene have a very large effect. So if you have that mutation, most likely you are going to have that disease. For a complex trait, it's common, it's affecting many people, it could be sporadic, you know, the also can run into family. But if they are in family, you know, the, you just cannot see obvious, you know, the Mendelian inheritance pattern. So probably you have a large pedigree, maybe, you know, one of people, one or two people have a disease, everybody else is uh, totally fine. That is caused by, you know, multiple variants or genes. And usually we call this uh, phenomenon as uh, polygenic. And it's because it's caused by multiple variants, and then if each variant of uh, have a, a small effect. So for Mendelian disease, we usually use this linkage analysis. There are just two types, you know, the parametric and the non-parametric. So and the name said, you know, the for parametric, you need a model, you need a specified inheritance model. And this is, uh, you know, the for large pedigrees, right? Because, uh, you know, the, for these pedigrees, you have uh, multiple uh, people having disease. So you know what the inheritance pattern is, but for non-parametric linkage analysis, because you know the, you are uh, you have a bunch of small families or pedigrees, you know the, it's very hard to identify inheritance pattern. So you don't need to specify the, uh, uh, you know, the inheritance model. So the data used, you know the okay. So without the model, how do we analyze them? Uh, so, uh, you know, the, I, I will talk about, you know, the, give you a, you know, the, uh, a figure, you know, to illustrate the information. 
but I don't want to go to the details. Yes, you can still do that. You know, that you can do so basically just through linkage, and so I will show you later. But if you really want to know some details, I can give you some papers. So uh, for markers, you know, the linkage analysis, they prefer the highly polymorphic markers. The, um, you know, the, the first, uh, not the requirement, the most, uh, the first one is they, if they have more alleles, you know, not like the sleep I'm talking about, uh, this one, usually, you know, back to old days, we use these uh, micro satellite markers. They have more than uh, two alleles. And then, you know, the, all these alleles have to be, you know, the, have a minor, uh, higher minor alleles frequency. That means that you have more people carry those alleles. And for the so-called micro uh, satellite markers, you know, the, the formal name should be short tandem repeats. So that means that you usually have three or more nucleotides, you know, you will less than 10. They repeat dozens of times. Uh, you need at least three or 400, you know, to cover the entire genome. For this SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism, you know, because they only have two alleles, so we need, you know, dramatically increase the number of uh, uh, markers. For example, for the, you know, the Illumina uh, linkage panel, they have uh, 6,000 SNPs. And of course, you can use, you know, the whole exome, whole genome sequencing data. So for complex traits, you know, the, so there are many methods, but you know, basically, uh, almost everyone uses association studies. So, uh, so back to old days, you know, the people use these candidate gene studies. So they just uh, search literature, you know, okay, based on the, you know, maybe pathway or animal model, they find, uh, okay, they just think, you know, some genes are maybe a candidate gene to uh, relate to a disease. Then they perform, you know, a simple association studies. But you know, for those studies, you know, the, standard, the sample size is usually very small. So in the statistical power is very low. And uh, it's uh, very hard to replicate. And uh, you know, the, actually, you know, the, for several uh, consortium or whatever study group, they just say, okay, these uh, candidate genes are not recommended. And uh, if you really want to publish a paper you know, in a high ranking journal, don't do it. And the GWAS, genome wide association study, is really a way to go. This is a hypothesis free. You just, you know, the interrogating the entire genome. And uh, this actually is, a, is almost the only method used in the past decade. So for the, uh, For data used in GWAS, it's, uh, it's almost uh, you know, inclusive the from this uh, genome-wide genotyping arrays. So from uh, you know, the several, they have uh, Illumina 5, have uh, 5 million SNPs, and that is a simple chip. Back to old days, you know, the, we only have uh, 250,000. And uh, you know, the, besides the SNP, or whatever the single nucleotide polymorphism, we also have a copy number variation. These are actually you know, the long uh, copy number, long uh, uh, DNA repeats, you know, the usually you know, and just uh, 1,000 to 2,000 base pair long. And uh, uh, for these arrays, not actually you know, the copy numbers on the array, they are just you know, the, still the snips on the array and the proxy or whatever tag. To do, the, uh, to do the copy number variation. You also have this uh, special arrays, like the exome array. They only focus on exonic region. They only have exonic SNPs. And you also have this uh, disease-specific array, uh, like the new neural X. This is uh, just actually just an ordinary array, plus some uh, uh, GWAS findings or SNPs uh, people already find from, from some neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer, like uh, you know, Parkinson disease. And this is this smoke screen, you know, the plus some, you know, the smoke, smoke addiction, drug addiction. 
uh, and this uh, population specific, you know, the, this is uh, just you know the, some SNPs they have a dramatically different population, uh, dramatically different uh, allele frequency, different populations. So this uh, AMR is just you know American mixed. So whatever color the population, except the East Asian, uh, are included in this uh, uh, array. AFR is you know the Africa, EU, European, EAS, East Asia, something. And all these arrays are just from two manufacturers, Illumina and FMA Matrix. I, it's not, I mean, you know, the either one is fine. I just pick whatever, you know, who give us is, you know, the lowest price. Of course, again, you know, you can use a whole exome and a whole genome sequencing data. So this is a figure, you know, the nice figure, you know, if you really want to do genetic analysis, if you read the NA, you know, the uh, review paper or introduction paper, you will see a figure similar like this. So in the X axis, you know, we have a low frequency range from, you know, very low to common to, uh, you know, the close to, you know, the fire 50%. And then on, on the Y, you have the effect size ranging from small to large. And you know, the, this is where you do uh, uh, linkage analysis because you know that this is rare variance from a large effect. So you can use a linkage panel, you know, use a micro satellite or you know, the SNP panel and then you know, the sequence data. Here, actually, the both of these are for com uh, complex disease or common complex trait. This part is for common variants. You know, you can do association studies, and you, you can use the GWAS array data. But this part, you know, this uh, rare variant with a small effect, you know, the, there's no way you can uh, get a reliable uh, 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 data from, you know, the GWAS array. You can only get it from a whole exome or whole genome. This part is missing because, you know, the you barely see any disease with a, uh, you barely see any common disease with a large effect. Uh, it's a not thing you know, that not exists. Or, mm, so just because you know, due to you know, the selection pressure, if there's any large effect, those people you know, the will die earlier, just you know, the cannot pass uh, those disease allele or whatever mutation to their offspring. So now we focus on linkage analysis. This is actually the Z classical genetic analysis method, and the only method you know we used in last century. So, but you know it's been relatively quiet in GWAS area. Uh, the two or three years ago, you know the, with the whole exome sequence data, whole genome sequence data, you know the you know, back then because you know the it still cost a lot. So people are usually just you know the uh, uh, sequencing several big pedigrees. So you know the people are studying reusing linkage analysis. The nice thing about the linkage analysis is it's very robust to this uh, population stratification. This is a huge problem when you do uh, association studies. The, that means you know the families from different ancestry groups. You know, can be analyzed together, and you don't need to address any uh, population stratification. Uh, this is uh, because you know the whatever you are doing uh, linkage or you know the uh, or uh, any statistical analysis. This is uh, you know the actually you comparing within families. So whatever you know the different populations uh, really cannot have uh, any effect on your analysis. The idea is just to identify markers linked to a disease locus. This is by you know the determining the recombination event or number of recombination event or whatever we call the recombination fraction between a marker and a disease locus. So this is a way you know, to show you know how linkage analysis works. You know that this pedigree, we can see four people, you know the these are uh, people having disease, these are shaded people, and then, you know, these are not shaded, unshaded, they are totally fine. And then each person, you know, they got, you know, the two copies of the same chromosomes, 
you know, wind from mother, I assume it is from mother, wind from father. And uh, you know, the, for these uh, people having disease, you know, this uh, red X, that means the disease locus, you know, the, so everyone has this uh, red X. So, uh, you know, the, uh, they're all having disease. So, and you know, for each uh, chromosome, actually we can, we call it each haplotype. You know, the, we have markers on each haplotype. So that means for the same marker, they have uh, two alleles. Yeah, and uh, you know, since it's normal, I didn't put anything here. So, for example, for, for this person, you know, the, uh, he inherited this part from his father. And you know also the disease locus. So you know the his uh, he has the disease because he only have one copy of the disease locus. So the inheritance pattern in this category is uh, dominant. And uh, we can see uh, this person and this person. You know the for this haplotype. So you know the upper part for this person the upper part comes from this uh, chromosome. And the lower part is from here. That means there's a crossover. And here, this part. So one this is a recombination. And the same thing for this person and this person. I'm just you know, showing how this works. You know, usually you don't see so many recombination in the same place. Uh, and then, you know, for this person, because the recombination happened here, so you know the he still have the uh, she she still have the uh, uh, disease locus, so that means you know the this recombination is uh, you know the related to the physical distance distance. If they are close to each other, the chance of recombination is very small. So uh, these two uh, marker and these two markers because they are you know the far from disease locus, you know this recombination and the same thing for these two. But for this blue marker, it's very close to the, you know, the disease locus. So it's always, you know, the passed to the offspring together. So we call this the linkage. And, you know, the, we just basically calculate how many recombinations between, uh, uh, the number of recombinations between a marker and the disease locus, then we get this uh, recombination fraction theta. And then we calculate this so-called lot score. And if you got a lot score larger than three, we call, okay, you have a significant linkage. And if you have a two, actually, you know, somebody use a two point two, you know, the, that's a, you, you can say I have a suggestive linkage. Uh, usually for your first, you know, the genome-wide linkage analysis, the region identified as very big, it's uh, five to 10 centimorgan. The so centimorgan is just you know, the genetic distance. Uh, it's, uh, if there's a one recombination event, then it's a uh, one, you know, we, we, we call it a one centimorgan. Uh, it's a roughly you know, the, at least uh, 10 million base of pair away. That means that this region will have you know, maybe a dozens of you know, to several hundred genes. And we need, you know, and more markers in that linked regions, you know, to do what we call a fine mapping, just to narrow down the, so the regions, narrow down the list of candidate genes. And this last one, this is a very nice, you know, the online database. It's free; you can access. You know, this catalog of all of the Mendelian diseases. You know, we reported in NA literature. And you know the their related genes. Yeah, again, you don't need to memorize everything. You know, they just know okay, there's something over there. If I need to go back to check, you know, they just uh, check these slides. This is a uh, you know the typical way to show linkage analysis results. So uh, on the Y, Y uh, X, you know, we have the chromosome one two, you know, arterial chromosome X. And you know this is just you know the, from you know the uh, beginning to the end of the chromosome, the best pair position, and the Y is just a lot of scores. And then in this study, you know we are so lucky. We have uh, three regions, you know the significant, and then we have a bunch of you know statistical linkage and results. So that's the reason we increased another you know, two to two point two. 
Otherwise, we just have too many findings, and people won't believe us. So this is uh, you know the uh, zoom in of that uh, you know the chromosome 14 region. You know, the, actually, we did a three analysis. This is a male only, and this is a female only. This is a male and a female combined. So sometimes, you know, the people do this male-female uh, differently, you know, the, not just because, you know, the, their phenotypes may be different. You know, the, their genetic map may be uh, different too. So usually, you know, the male for male, so I, I think, I don't remember exactly, but I think the male, you know, have, you know, the um, uh, more recombination than female. Yeah, again, you know, the, you can see the uh, link region, they are very wide. Even for the, you know, the, you know, the peak region, it's, also, it's still from 32 to 42. It's um, pretty big. Yeah, actually, you can see, you know, the, for the combined analysis, uh, Almost the one third of the chromosome, you know, it's covered almost one third of the chromosome. So for G1, you know, like I said before, it's a dominant genetic analysis in the past decade. The first paper published in 2005, and you know, the, since 2008, 2009, you know, everyone is doing G1. And in, in this sample, you know, the, can be just you know, unrelated sample, related sample, mixed. And um, basically, then just whatever you want, whatever you can get. And this, this is, a, you know, the, for common variants only, you know, the, usually the lowest cutoff for the minor reference is 3% to 5%. You can go even lower, you know, to 1% if you have, you know, the uh, hundreds of thousands or maybe, you know, millions of data, you know, the, for the sample from a larger consortium or larger bell band. But, uh, I don't recommend you know you go lower than one percent. If you then very low, you really want to do whatever use the real variant analysis. Then I will talk about it later. So instead of doing linkage, we are looking for association between the disease locus and the genetic marker. This is through this called so called you know the linkage disequilibrium, and short for L, short name LD. This is just whatever the formal definition, the tendency of two or more alleles occur more than and random. So uh, here's an illustration, you know, the, uh, this uh, you know, the part of a chromosome or part of you know, the haplotype, uh, no, no, hapl uh, a piece of a chromosome. We have a SNP 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and we also have you know, another SNP, I call it a you know, tag SNP, and we have a disease locus, the nearby, and uh, this uh, you know the, all these uh, markers here we call them the one LD block. That means you know the all markers in this LD block, including the disease locus and what this tag SNP, they all have a similar minor allele frequency. So when you do a association analysis, they will have a similar p values and effect. And for all markers, you know the Outside of this LD block, or maybe they are in different LD block, usually they are, you know, the minor frequency will be dramatically different than whatever in your LD block. So, uh, you know, the, for the, all the snippets in the same LD block, we usually just choose one to do association analysis. That means, you know, the, uh, we don't need to put every snip from the genome on whatever than the JWAS array. We only need to put the tag SNPs over there. That can dramatically reduce the cost. And that's the reason, you know, the, when uh, you can see, you know, the, when you check a DB SNP, when you check one sound genome, they are, you know, at least, you know, the 50,000, uh, uh, yeah, 50 million SNPs, but on each array, you only test, you know, around one million SNP. That's enough. That's good enough to catch all this, you know, the association signal or whatever the disease locus signal. So this is uh, how you analyze, you know, the binary trait. You know, the, you have a bunch of cases, you have a bunch of controls. You know, the, uh, I'm using two uh, SNPs and an and example, you know, green SNP and the red SNP. And, you know, the four uh, 
uh, uh, for the green sleep, you see, you know, the, almost the same number of people are carrying the, you know, the minor alleles. So in, they have that means they have a sim similar minor frequency. So that's no association. But for red one, you can see more cases that have this uh, carry this minor allele than controls. Then we say there is an association. How far further if you are doing you know, the, uh, whatever statistical test you prefer and get a p-value. This is for a uh, uh, quantitative trait. You know, the, just you know, a bunch of numbers, one, two, three, you know, not just you know, yes or no. Uh, here, you know, actually we are comparing the genotypic means. So uh, you, there are two kinds of ways to compare. You know, this is what we call the genotypic testing, and this is the allelical testing. So uh, on the Y scale, you know, different genotypes, you know, the, we still, again, we have two markers, you know, green one and the blue one, different genotypes, you know, the, and on the Y, you know, this is just the mean value for whatever you are, uh, you know, quantitative trait. For this uh, genotypic testing, you know, the, you see for the green one, the means, the genotypic means are similar. The mean, again, you know, there's no association. But for blue one, you know, the, with the increased number of the, you know, the minor allele, the minor allele C, so zero copy, one copy, and the two copies, see the mean value increase. Okay, then, you know, we say, you know, there's uh, association. The same thing here, the only difference, you know, the instead of testing uh, zero, one, two copies, we just say, okay, you carry that, you know, the minor allele not. We just uh, combine, you know, the one copy to two copies together. You know, the, when you are um, sniff a minor allele print very low, you know, the, you don't see many people, you know, homozygous for your minor allele frequency, uh, minor allele. So you let, you let just uh, combine them to do uh, allelic testing. So there are many, you know, the tools, software, programs, you can do GWAS analysis. Yeah, I only want to talk about this one called Plink. And then, you know, they also have a fast and improved version called Plink tool. This is a very comprehensive tool. You can use it to do, you know, the data management in QC performance analysis. And then actually, you know, the, because of this one is uh, so user friendly, so easy to use. And this, uh, you know, the, it's uh, almost, uh, you know, the, uh, was developed at the same time, you know, the first g was. This is a fine format and actually it's a standard for, you know, the energy was analysis. So if you really want to learn Plink, learn GWAS, start from Plink. Uh, I prefer you to use this Plink tool, you know, because it's fast and, you know, it's, it's I mean, you know, it's a hundred times faster. But their document is kind of horrible. So you, you read the, you know, the original document first to get you familiar with the, what the command does. Uh, and you know the best, uh, uh, you know the all their usage or whatever, you know the uh, I uh, almost the same. So this uh, multiple testing problem. This is uh, just because you know we are testing many markers, you know the hundreds of thousands to several millions, you know the. I guess often, you know, you know, the, for the p-value less than 0.5, you heard this before, you know, the, I have uh, some testing, I have a p-value less than 0.5, so I find something significant. But, you know, that's just for, you know, the uh, several tests. This is, for example, you know, if you have 100 tests, only five can be positive just by, purely by chance. But if you are testing one million sniffs, you know, you will have 50,000 uh, positive findings, so purely by chance. So that is a, just it's way too many positive findings. So the right way to do this is uses use the Bonferroni correction. So instead of using 0.5, if you are testing 1 million SNPs, your threshold will be, you know, 0.05 divided by 1 million. But that is just too strained. This is because, you know, more or less, you know, all of these SNPs are in LD. So, 
use if you are using that threshold, you barely can find anything. You know, there are other ways you can do a permutation or you can do a you know, false discovery rate. This just takes too much time to run. So the you know the we just use this uh, phi to the ne power of negative eight. So uh, I don't know where exactly this number is from. You know, the, just because old days, you know, the, we have a uh, uh, around you know the uh, fifty hundred thousand snips and the first paper use this one, then everybody just use this one. This threshold it's not gold standard, but in the you when you try to write a paper, better use this threshold. And the things you need to be uh, you need to uh, consider. The first one, of course, is a covariate. You know the, Whatever corrects you think is important, you have to uh, include in your study. Another one is, you know, that if this is a family sample, you better adjust the family relationships. There are tons of ways to do that. I'm not going to talk about it. If you don't adjust them, you will get more, you know, your result will be inflated. You will get more false positive findings. And this, uh, Population stratification, you know, the, I mentioned this before. If you are doing a uh, linkage analysis, uh, this is not a problem. But for uh, association studies, it's a really a problem. I mean, using this, uh, you know, the SNP and the example, this gene, you know, the, it's a well known, very famous gene. You know, the, if you are doing alcohol research, and you know, the people, when, uh, you know, people drink alcohol, if they uh, carry the you know the uh, minor allele of this uh, SNP, you know they they uh, the you know the, they have, they have a slow speed to process alcohol in your blood. So you know you will see people with a red face. You know they feel comfortable, not com not feel comfortable, and then most likely they, they are from East Asian. You can see you know the uh, see the allele frequency. This is from European, from Finnish European people. You can see almost no one can resist a minor allele. And uh, Africa, you know, the increase a little bit. And uh, if you are, you know, the Ashkenazi Jews, you know, the see the frequency dramatically increase. And uh, if you are East Asian, you can see this minor, minor allele actually change to major allele. So if your sample is mixed, you know, the, if you are mixed, uh, for example, mixed uh, African or mixed European with uh, East Asian, your result, if you are, don't adjust its population stratification, your re result could be totally due to these different uh, allele frequencies from different populations, not from the, whatever the disease you are interested in. So, yeah, so how to adjust them? We use this, you know, the, what we call the genetic component for, you know, whatever this is genetic ancestry. So you, you hear people talk about the genetic ancestry. That's because, you know, the, the you know, the people you know, often claim, okay, I'm a, uh, you know, the, I'm a Native American, the, I'm a whatever, you know, the, when you check their genetic condition, they really, really don't. You know the whatever you know the, the from whatever the you know the uh, come from whatever the ancestry they claim. So you know, like you know the Nikki Haley, you know this is a very you know the some we say a lot. You know many people claim they are Native American. You know they usually just have you know a quarter or one eighth of a Native American. I, I don't know, maybe because of benefit that have or something, you know, they're just proud of their ancestry. And another thing is, you know, the, uh, the way, you know, they design this uh, questionnaire, you know, the, if you go to whatever U.S. survey, they also have, you know, I think the first one, they have uh, ethnicity. They have also, you know, the, for example, you claim you are, you know, the white or not, and then you, they ask you, you are Hispanic or not. I don't remember how they do, do this. So, Many whatever you know that they claim they are white, they actually they are Hispanic. They are they claim they are Hispanic, they are actually pure white, pure Caucasian. 
So this is uh, done, you know, the, we call this, you know, the principal component from uh, their genetic ancestry. We, uh, we calculate using the, all the uh, uh, genome-wide array data, you know, whole uh, genome data. So you can say X, you know, we can get the principal components. Here I show you two principal components. Then, you know, the first two. So the X is the principal, first principal component. We call it PC1. I don't think you can say it. And then, you know, the Y is the PC2. And uh, this purple one, this is a uh, Yoruban from Nigeria. And I have a you know, West African ancestry. And uh, this uh, red, these red dots, they are from European, Northwestern European, from, you know, the, uh, I think from French or you know, the coast of Belgium. And this is uh, East Asia. And you can see the first uh, principal component, PC1, totally separate, you know, the Africa from other continent. And the PC2, totally separate, you know, the uh, East Asian from uh, other continent. And these blue dots, these are our study sample. And you can see a bunch of people, you know, they have uh, African, uh, you know, the ancestry. And there's four people around here, and they are African Americans. And the people around here, they are Native Americans. You know, the, they, they have, you know, the, the part of the East Asian ancestry. So the people in the middle, you know, or maybe probably all of these people, they are just uh, Hispanic uh, or Latino. And if they are close to, close to this side, they are more likely, you know, from the mainland America, because, you know, they have a more uh, Native American origin. If they are close to African American, most likely they are from Caribbean. You know, for those people from Caribbean, they have a more uh, African ancestry. So usually what we do is uh, just, uh, you know, they include uh, whatever principal, number of principal components, you know, and the covariance in your study. So if you are study samples, you know, the only this African American, probably two, is, two principal components are enough. If you just mix all your samples together, maybe you need you know, the up to you know, 10 principal components in your analysis. Depends on you know, the, the sample size you have. So for imputation, like I said before, you know, right now, uh, if you check db snip, you can see you know, there are at least 80 million variants over there. But you know, the, in a typical JWAS array, you have you know, the, around the 1, one million variants. How can we increase, increase coverage without genotyping more additional markers? So we, 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 uh, we do this by using this imputation. The basic idea is to use a reference panel. So right now it's, a, it's a either you know, 100 genomes or it's from the Hanford type reference consortium, uh, HRC. HRC actually include um, most of the 100 genome samples. And you know that all these samples are whole genome sequenced. That means we know the, uh, you know the genotype and every locus. So how many samples are in HRC? Sixty-five thousand right now. That's the uh, you know the. They're all whole genome sequence. Yes, they just you know the they they, they just uh, combine you know the one thousand genomes or whatever you know the available whole genome sequence data together. Okay, but when when you do the uh, imputation, you always you also need to go back to the asymmetric group. No, you, that's, uh, you know, the original idea, you know, the, uh, and the first, uh, you, okay, if your sample is uh, uh, Caucasian, your sample is European ancestry, you have to use uh, whatever European samples you want from genome. But right now, you don't need to do that. Oh. They, they just want to, you know, the whatever increase your sample size, and they increase, not, and they also increase the reference panel sample size. They have a very complicated uh, statistical way to actually not just use the uh, you know, longer haplotype, they use a smaller haplotype. Yeah, actually, you know, the, they just uh, changed to that recently. So you don't have to worry about the, the, the grids of this individual. No, no, no. You have to use the same reference to do the imputation. Yeah, and you don't need to separate your data either. Just put everything together, yeah, to uh, done. 
best work. Yes. And uh, another thing, you know, uh, people don't use HRC before is, you know, the, uh, until recently they added the uh, X chromosome. They only have autos, uh, autosome before. And uh, another thing, is, you know, the, and I'll show you later, you know, HRC. Uh, I say here. Yeah, HRC is uh, only from imputation server. So if you have some restrictions, if you are institutional RRB or whatever, you know, the, uh, have some restrictions, you cannot use the HRC. You have to use one solid genome. So this is a way to show, you know, the how uh, imputation uh, is performed. So you, you know, basic idea is just to compare the haplotype between your sample, your sample and, uh, you know, the whatever your reference sample. I mentioned the haplotype before. This is a formal definition. A group of values and are from a, a single parent. So uh, you can see, you know, this is your reference panel. Every one, every locus is a genotype. We didn't see any question mark. So the zero means zero copy of a minor allele, one copy of a minor allele, etc. And uh, this is your study sample. And you can see for this snip, this snip, every one has the question marks. That means, you know, the, these markers are not on your array. And uh, you also see, you know, question marks here and there. That means uh, for whatever re reason, you know, the, these uh, uh, genotypes uh, for these particular pe uh, people, you know, the, it's not a successful genotype, uh, maybe, you know, band quality or some reason. Then you just compare, you know, the uh, uh, haplotype. So for example, you know, the, for this first person, we just see this uh, part, you know, the haplotype. The zero, one, question mark, one. You're just looking for the, you know, the reference panel, probably this one, zero, one. So, you know, the, for the zero, one, for the first, second, and third, they all match. So we can say, okay, the question mark is also one. Yeah, this is exactly, you know, how it works. Then, then they just do some, you know, the complicated way. Then, you know, they fill all these holes. So, you know, the, for common SNPs, you know, if you have a minor load is larger than 5%, and then your sample size, you know, in several hundred. So the imputation results is very good. You can impute it, you know, accurately. And it depends on the sample size and you know, what types of array. So basically the coverage of array or number of the SNPs on your array, you know, the low frequency SNPs and less than 1% or 5% can also be imputed. And uh, I don't recommend that you go even lower. It's uh, not because of the way, you know, the, 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 the whatever this software program, you know, the don't work. It's just because the reference panel, you know, the, they don't, you don't see many people carry, you know, the, uh, uh, those, uh, you know, the minor alleles. And that means the reference panel is not, uh, uh, not good. So the basic principle is, you know, if you have bigger sample, you have better imputation, and if you have a higher, higher coverage, you have better imputation. And usually after imputation, you will have at least, you know, six million to more than 10 million, you know, high quality steps or variants in your analysis. And this actually, you know, this is a major purpose of people do uh, uh, imputation. Then you know, uh, samples, you know, from different arrays, then we'll have, uh, you know, the more overlapping SNPs. That means you can combine all data together from multiple studies together and increase, dramatically increase your sample size and make your finding more robust and you can have a, a, a ability to detect, you know, the variance with a very small effect. Yeah, these are the methods, and you know, the, these entries are all methods you can use for imputation. The first one is, uh, you know, the, uh, we call the Michigan imputation server, you know, uh, maintained by the University of Michigan. It's uh, online only, you know, the, this one has access to HRC. So basically, you just make a VCF files, you know, the upload to them, they will do everything for you. They, you know, they check the quality, you know, the, you, your data, they just, uh, you know, the, you don't need to whatever set the whatever parameters, they just upload your files, 
and then you know that after several days you send your emails you are done you know the download your data but the problem with that is that like i said before you have to have approval to send your data outside of the institute and not many you know the, not every study have you know, the, that permission and then if you cannot send your data out you can always download these standalone programs and the downside of this is you can only use you know, the one sound genome and uh, all these uh, programs are very easy to set up so you can either from just in you know, a clean format or VCL format of course you need to figure out you know what are program, pro program parameters uh, you want to use sometimes uh, it's, uh, just it is a kind of a challenge so the combined data to increase power this is you know the this is actually you know very important right now it's it is very hard to publish a paper you know just from a single study you know the for those high ranking journals you have to have at least you know the hundred and tens of thousand sample you know the for and if you the study the study have you know that just you know the you know, several thousand then you have to have an independent replication sample uh, study to confirm your finding. This is just because the you know, individual studies, you know, the, due to funding or maybe just you know, not enough people to carry out another you know, the study, they usually they just have small to moderate sample size, and the power is very limited. And if you combine data, you know, they can dramatically increase your sample size. The first way is just what people call the mega analysis. Simply combining, you know, individual genotype data from multiple studies together. But you know, the all study had to be recorded on the same protocol. Otherwise, you know, you have this, uh, uh, they call it, you know, the study heterogeneity problem. You know, we, we just found this, you know, in many uh, studies. We just ramp our study, you know, the, uh, Actually, several weeks ago, you know, the, we all studying in Parkinson's disease. You know, the, but you know, one is from, uh, you know, the all, uh, everywhere, you know, the in the world. Another is from, you know, the Israel. And the results, you know, the, we just cannot combine data together. We simply combine them together. It's just uh, for some reason, we, you know, the, 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 we 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 do not understand what caused the problem. These st two studies, although they are all studying Parkinson's disease, they are just different. And then we can rule out that genetic difference. And again, this restriction on individual data sharing is really a problem. Especially, you know, they are from a private company. And then I will show it before, you know, the, yeah. I think everybody knows that the 23 and me, they have tons of data. You know, they have genetic data, they also have phenotype data, but their data cannot send out of that building. So if we want to, you know, the, have a collaboration with them, you either, you know, the, okay, send your data to them, do the analysis, or, you know, the, uh, last year I spent a week over there. I, I was there, but I cannot touch anything. So I have to test, okay, you type that command, you type this command. So it's uh, really annoying, you know. <laughs> right now we are trying to write a paper, you know, the, Every time we are we ask something, okay, we need this point of paper, we are not to talking to their mm, uh, researcher. We are talk, we have to talk to their lawyers. They say, okay, you it's okay or not, you you can you know the, put this. Uh, so it's, it's really annoying, you know. So the way to go is really you know the meta analysis. In meta analysis, only summary statistics. Only p value and their effects is needed. You don't need to any individual genotype, uh, genotype data. And you know, the, you, each study, it's uh, just uh, we use its weight because you know the different studies have a different sample size. For those bigger studies, you know, the studies with uh, uh, larger samples, their results are more statistically you know, the robust. So we want to put more weight on their sample. And also, you can use the inverse uh, of the estimates uh, standard error. It's basically the same idea. And uh, because you know that you you are not dealing with uh, individual genome uh, type data, 
So I create you know, this robust, uh, kind of a robust uh, to this uh, study uh, specific of you know, you, you know, the heterogeneity among participants in studies. And the lines that uh, your phenotypes are similar, not different dramatically. And then you can, you know, for each study, you just put up whatever you want and you know, include whatever you want and cover it. And then you can do, uh, you know, the uh, trans ancestral analysis, you know, put the you know, data from African American, from European together. And so on, you thought, you know, that caused by the same disease gene or genetic variant. And uh, this is somewhat overlapping. This is actually, you know, the uh, this is actually, you know, the very serious problem. If you have a disease that's kind of rare, not many people carrying this disease. You know, this, and the same, you know, the PD example, we just finished uh, several days ago. About, uh, we, we, we collect data, you know, from multiple sites, you know, actually you know, around the world. We just find, you know, about five to more than 5% of the samples. They just uh, participate in more than, you know, the multiple studies. They, 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 are, they, they are just desperate, you know. They, whenever, you know, each, uh, any study reach to them, they say, uh, okay, I'm going to participate. And then, you know, they just want people, you know, to find a uh, way to cure their disease quickly. And then if you use, for some studies, you know, because they give money, you know, for you know, participants in the studies, you see tons of people, you know, just, you know, the, okay, as participate in the money, participate the study to earn money. So this sample overlapping problem is, uh, you know, depend on your disease. But right now, you know, that they have a great way to correct, I mean, to, uh, uh, to over, you know, the overcome this uh, some of lamping bias. And then this, uh, if you really want to do meta analysis, probably this is the only program you want to use. So uh, almost everybody is using this program. This is a typical way you show the GWAS result. We call it a uh, Manhattan plot. Just, just because, you know, these are the top buildings, you know, the, in Manhattan. And uh, uh, so on the X, you know, the, say these are the uh, each uh, chromosome position, and uh, for each cr chromosome, we use different color to represent each chromosome. And the Y, uh, it's a negative log term p value. And in this study, we see we have three regions, and the genome is significant, have a p value less than five to the, you know, the negative eight. Here, this one, this one, and this one, chromosome 9. For these two, chromosome 9 and chromosome 7, you can see a bunch of SNPs have a similar, actually less in you know, the SNPs over there. We call, you know, that they are in LD. All these results have LD support. So most likely they are real. For this one, it's just a lone star over there. And then you want to pay more attention to check, you know, the, the quality, you know, the so, you know, the, if nothing uh, wrong, then you want to check, you know, maybe there are some, you know, the low frequency, you know, the, uh, you know, the really missense mutation. Yeah. In most, most of the time, you know, there are just some false positive. Occurrently, there may be something real, like the, in the ADH1B I showed you before. You know, again, this is just a zoom in of the, whatever you are finding. You know, X is still uh, the prompt position, and these are genes near whatever your region. And uh, again, Y is the uh, negative log 10 p value. This is your top SNP, genome wide thickening SNP, the purple diamond. And uh, so the, these colors, you know, these are different SNPs that become different colors. So this is uh, what we call the LD. You know, we measure to use this R square. Range from a zero to one with a higher R square and means higher LD. So you see, you know, there are bunch of SNPs larger than 0.8 with uh, these top SNPs. If you see a nice pattern like this, you know, the people are just say, okay, your findings are real. These are these peaks are what we call the recombination hot spot. Usually, they are they define the LD blocks, LD boundary. And you can see, you know, almost all our findings are in within this big LD block, 
uh, several small ones over there, but in, in overall, in general, you know, they are in uh, within this big LD block. So and actually, you know, every paper you need to show this, you need to show Manhattan plot, and then for every significant finding, you need to show this to you know convince a reviewer your findings are real. This is data sharing. You know, the, like I said, you know, the nowadays it's very important. It's not only just encouraged. If you are funded by NIH, you are required to share your data. So after you are done, you have to put your data to a DBGAP, database of genotype and phenotype. Just in order to let other people to have free access to your data. And also people in you know, order to form this big consortium, this is a special consortium. I just you know, the, put two examples here. It's a GFORCE, this is for osteoporosis. I think right now they already have a I don't remember exactly 200,000 people, and it is a PTC, probably you know the half million people, close to half million people, and uh, you also have a lot of bell banks. They don't focus on you know the particular uh, phenotype of disease. They just uh, okay ask whatever volunteer. They collect all their health information, and then in some time, uh, sometimes they follow them you know the longitudinally. And uh, also collect their DNA, you know, whatever our tissue sample. So um, this is the most famous, uh, the famous one, and everybody is trying to get access to the U UK United Kingdom Bell Bank. They have um, more than one million people with, you know, uh, more than about half million people already genotyped, and I think uh, more than ten thousand people already whole genome sequenced, and they. This one, you know, whatever you can just uh, apply to get free access. And in the United States, we have this uh, meeting veteran program, and uh, name said, you know, they try to recruit uh, more than one million veteran. And uh, this UK Bell Bank, uh, this is uh, uh, kind of, you know, the, the purpose of the general population, but you know, because of the way. People respond, you know, the, it's a, a little bit biased. It's a meaning veteran program. It's, a, it's actually, you know, the more focused, not not purposely, but because you know, these uh, veterans have a kind of uh, particular psychiatric problem. So, if you want to other data, you know, the, um, other than this psychiatric disease, this may not be that good. But they are trying to increase sample size to generate to, to, to get you know the much um, more people and have a general information close to the general population. Yeah, private companies tend to surround me. Yeah, the nice thing is they have both phenotype and genotype data. You know, you also have a, like you know ancestry.com. They have genotype data, but you know their phenotype information is not uh, as comprehensive as me. And some uh, pharmaceutical companies, they just started to recruit uh, or collect this data. So, can you tell me the 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 phenotype data is basically coming from the survey, right? Yeah, they have uh, you know the uh, sometimes they use whatever this. Uh, Everybody, you know, the well expands the questionnaire. Sometimes they just use their own questionnaire. They direct their own questionnaire. But it's, it's really just a very superficial phenotype. And whether oh, it's definitely not, you know, the deep. Uh, yeah, I said whether yeah. you drink or not, whether you, you had this disease before or not, it's very, very superficial. Yeah, and, and that's not a problem with Tanya S3 and me. You know, every large uh, bell bank has the same problem. People just don't have time, you know, to sit with you, spend hours to answer all your questions. So actually, I didn't put anything here. You know, the, the other uh, bio banks, you know, the, they just use the electronic uh, uh, health record, the EHR. They just, you know, the, uh, get uh, what, whatever information from their uh, you know, health record, but. Uh, I know that people are starting to do that. So from like you know the. Well, the, 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 the 
when we were Kissinger, you know the uh, I don't remember what the name for the you know the open one. The the problem with that you know the the clean up the electronic health record. That's a kind of a challenge, because <laughs> whatever different hospital you know they have a different way, you know the, to harmonize this data set. It uh, takes time. And another thing is you know the if you really want to if you really care for the general population. That's this is not the you know the if you care about a particular disease that's uh, really interesting for the general population, not a good way to go. So the purpose of this uh, data collaboration, like I said, uh, you want to detect uh, you know the variant with an even smaller effect, and you know the, with a bigger sample size, it's possible that you can do a gene to gene interaction, and you can do a gene environmental interaction. So you know the, and actually you know the, and then they have data just you know the submit the data to this uh, uh, to this uh, whatever consortium like uh, you know the just find people to collaborate with you. Don't worry, worry about you know people will steal your data. So at the end you have a collaboration. You always have early access uh, to the data. So you know the until your paper. Is published, then other people can apply to get access to your data. And you know, if you have a you know large sample size, you can always go to a, you know the high ranking journal. And if if you check you know the Nature Genetics or whatever you know the those are, you know high ranking journals, their G was uh, results always from those big consortia. Yeah, and you know that. If you don't have data, you just apply to get access. Then you can, you know, the, do whatever analysis you want. The last one, the angle is just, you know, the, tell you, go there. If you want to check GWAS results, this uh, in this website, they, you know, the search every literature, you know, about the GWAS. They put, you know, the all the findings in this database. And then right now, I think, you know, they have tens of thousands. Of J was finding J was significant findings over there, with you know the, almost every common disease. It's a missing heritability problem. So although you know that we have a tens of thousands of findings to date, you know the common variants only explain a small portion. It's a really small portion. So let, I'm using this example alcohol dependence. People always say the heritability is around the. 50%, that means, okay, you know, the whatever the this variation, 50% is from genetic, so from whatever your uh, genotype. But then so far, all our findings are only 10 to 20%. We have 30%, and at least 30% heritability is missing. That's the reason, you know, people are looking for rare variants. People are thinking, okay, maybe this rare variant are responsible for this missing heritability problem. But so far, you know, actually, you know, the, that's another story of the, this rare variants can only explain another small portion of genetic variation. There's still a lot, a large portion of missing. So this rare, very, very, rare variant is looking for this part, and then we can only use, you know, the whole exome and the whole genome sequencing data. So this part is really related to your plan. And then, you know, the, for if you are doing a single variant and a, a test, you know, single rare variant and that's in theory, any method I talked before previously, you can use. But the genetic power is a totally different story. I will talk it later. And you know, the, besides this uh, formal statistical test, you can do a, you know, the, if you are, you, you have a pedigree data, you can do a, you know, simple segregation analysis. This, this is just, you know, the, uh, for the, the pedigrees, you just compare, okay, also which variants, you know, the carried by these uh, affected people and not carried by these uh, not affected people, unaffected people. For example, for the uh, dominant and X link, you just say, okay, you know, the, uh, these people can be a real variants or not. If they, both of them, all of them carry the same variant, 
but not current this, uh, this you know, the unaffected people. You know, okay, you can say, okay, this is my candidate variant or candidate gene. They can narrow down the list of the your candidate gene, but you know, not that much. But for recessive, is this a totally different story? Because for a recessive, you know, the disease, benign disease, it requires a homozygous carrier. You know, you, you have to have two copies of a minor allele. And because they are rare, the chance is actually very small. So this one can dramatically narrow down your candidate gene. And also this uh, de novo mutation, that's a new mutation. So the both parents are fine, and they don't carry that mutation. But you know, the unfortunate, they have kids, and they have a disease, and they carry this new mutation. This, uh, you know, the yeah, this is uh, actually, you know, this is uh, uh, very frequently see, you know, in autism. You see the both parents are totally fine, but, you know, just for some reason, they have an uh, autism case. They have a case, you know, the autistic case. Yeah. How, how can you tell it's a de novo mutation or just a recessive gene? Because, you know, the both parents don't have, don't carry that mutation. But if it's recessive, both oh. Both of them doesn't carry the mutation. Yes. Okay. Yes. After doing the trial, you have it. Okay. Yeah. Actually, another. If you, you read it, not get that from the pedigree, right? No, this is just looking for a new mutation. Right. Yeah. I I, I am not familiar with this uh, autism, but you know that it seems. Uh, if you uh, check or whatever, you you read that paper, you find that paper, you can see okay, it's always you know the not the same mutation run into you know the many different families. It's always, you know, the different mutation on the same gene. They just, you know, the anchoring, you know, the, because the autism is always uh, uh, well studied, they have a bunch of candidate genes. They just check the, you know, the, the, the novel mutation on the genes, and it's just a fun bunch of them over there. Yeah, so this is, you know, the why you can use whatever the method, the statistical method I talked about before in single variant analysis for rare variant analysis. But the problem is you know, the power. So this is just a thing for the power calculation. You know, the, for just you know, you testing 100,000 rare variants, actually that's a pretty number for, big number of variants you are going to you know, test in your typical study. If you're just uh, increasing your Significant threshold to the negative seven, and you have all the ratio of two. Actually, that's pretty big, and then the minor represents one percent. It's almost the upper limit. You know, the, when you define a rare variance, you need five thousand samples to have another you know, eighty percent power. That's you know, the, you can ask you know how much you know he will charge you if you you know the sequence five thousand samples. Half a million dollars. Yeah. And you know, the, of course, you need a replication to validate you know, whatever you're finding is real. Then you need you know, the, another larger sample, replication sample. So the idea is you know, that instead of testing them one by one, we test them you know, collectively. We group them together. We just put all of them together based on a gene or a pathway. So you know, the, for example, if you have 10 variants in a gene, and then, you know, in your sample, only, you know, each, uh, each variant, is only you see one carrier. So instead of testing one by one, we just group them together. And then now we have uh, 10 carriers. And uh, another thing, is, you know, you, because you group the, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the variants together, the number of testing you, are, you, you perform is decreasing. So, that means you know the, the number of tests decrease. These are the two questions you need to answer, you know, before you perform you know this uh, group based analysis. The first one the what variants should I group them together? And you know the how to perform the test. The so definitely more variants you know, than definitely not good. This is a, you know, the, if you increase the more variance, 
more stakes you are introducing noise, and this then can uh, decrease your power dramatically. The first, uh, you know, the uh, criteria is range uh, has to be rare, because you know that you are looking for you know the rare variance. But how rare should it be? The you 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 better you know the uh, use whatever your disease prevalence. You know, just saying you know, how many you know the disease carrier you observe in your general population. This is an example. If you know this is actually the rare disease. If you see only you know point of one percent of people you know that have this disease, and you really don't want to increase your uh, threshold you know the much larger than one point one percent. Probably you know the maybe point five percent, you know the one percent at the most. You really don't want to go you know higher than one percent. And again, you know, that you can use you know the variance kind of uh, biological functions. But the problem is we don't know them their function. We have a bunch of variants, we don't know their functions. So uh, you can use this uh, the Bellingham Max tools. I think you probably familiar with Sift Polypen Polypen Cat. Yeah, the problem is you know, the, they are not perfect. We did a comparison. You know, if you do a com pairwise comparison, pro probably the concordance rate you know, between any any two of them, you know, it's uh, seventy five percent and the most. So probably you want to you know the, use multiple tools you know, to confirm or to validate each other. So how should we test them? You know, the each variant have different effects. These are, you know, the two extremes, you know, the stop loss. You know, the, because you have a truncated protein, the protein, you know, the main have no any function. And then we, if you are have just a point of mutation and whatever then the point of mutation, you know, that it's also makes sense, but you know, the amino acid, they, are, they have a similar. So you just have a slightly reduced function. So what we do is we again we use a weight function, weight function. So if for stop loss, you know the, we put more weight. If for point of mutation, we put less weight. We right now you know we don't have many uh, good ways. Most people just use this uh, transformation for minor minor low frequency. Use this uh, beta one twenty five transformation. It's just you know the no any particular biological, you know, the way why we use the beta 125, we just check the distribution, you know, okay, we just say, okay, it looks like a beta distribution, so we just use that. Of course, I can use, you know, the particular function score, for example, like a CAT score, if you it's, uh, need below 10, it's a usually benign mutation, larger than 30, it's a very, very deleterious. And then, you know, the, another extreme is, you know, different variants. They have a different directions of effect. Some variants, you know, that cause disease, and the other variants protect you from having disease. You can use this, you know, the particular standard test called SCAD, sequence association test. So this is a summary of this method. You know, I'm going all from this paper. It's a, um, you don't need to read the entire paper. The introduction and discussion is uh, good enough. So the, the summary of whatever the method. This is a summary of the, you know, the software. You know, the personal, I, I only use this one right now. This is actually the program suite. You know, you can put a, uh, perform you know, many kinds of tests. And the input file is just a VCF file. And it's uh, pretty fast. And you can do, you know, the related data, on the data, or mixed data, whatever data you have. So when you do, um, uh, you know, the relevant, uh, relevant analysis, if you are using family sample, the nice thing about family sample is they have a larger effect. You can do a separate analysis. And then uh, I think you know, they probably already talked about this family information actually can improve the quality of the you know, variant calling. But in the problem is that it's a long, take a longer time to recruit the family data. Especially in the United States, you know, people live all around the country. 
for unrelated sample, nicene is you know, the, it's, uh, very easy to collect sample. And uh, this is actually the very important. You can uh, use external controls to dramatically increase your sample size. So wh wh why the control is so important in the real variant analysis? That could be, you know, if you didn't see a variant in your control, that could be due to the, because that's so rare. You didn't see it just pure by chance. See this one, if the metric is 1%, you only see one carry, 100 sam 500 sample. You just don't want to you know, spend uh, you know, tons of money to sequence those controls. So that's the reason you can use this public available control, like the one you, know, you can download from TV, TV gap. There are, you know, the, I don't remember exactly uh, right now, you know, I'm sure tens of thousands of people, whole genome or whole exome sequence, you can download from DB gap, then use them as the external control. But you know, the, those data, then maybe you know, the, from different disease, so you have a cohort effect, they have a sequence on different platforms, uh, uh, from different labs, so from different batch, you have to adjust this effect, otherwise you will get a false positive. This is really a nice program, you know, the, uh, to, uh, to remove the batch effect. This is the paper, uh, it's a kind of, you know, the statistics. So, you know, the, you just need this paper over there. You just need to know this paper over there. And then this is their basic principle. They just compare the order ratio between the uh, internal control and the internal plus external control. External control. And, you know, the, you just uh, whatever seems your case, probably, you know, the same number of control or half number of control, then just combine with uh, whatever available from the you know, external control. Then you do a uh, performance analysis. So to, to, to do this, you, you need to sequence the controls. Yes. But, but it, a, it can lock in other controls to increase the number of controls. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, if but you... I always sequence the disease uh, group. Doesn't sequence the no, control. you can never do that. You, know, you, you can never do that because there's no way you can... Uh, because whatever your batch effect, or whatever other effect, it's always, you know, the have the same definition as your case and control. We call that the collinearity problem. So you can never find anything real. Then see, so you, I think you are you, you heard this before again and again. People claim they find a gene, so they basically they just find you know the whatever variance within or near gene. It's a, if it's association, associative gene, if linkage, linked to a gene. And you know, they didn't check the gene far away. Like, you know, the, there's a transacting effect. And you know, they, 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 they don't know the role, whatever the gene they claimed was their biological function. So you really need a functional study, you know, wetland functional study. You know, cell line, model L organism, or whatever in the, ideally you need a clinical trial. But I'll, we will talk about it later. The, the problem, you know, the cost of money and the time consuming. What can you do now? They just, you know, the, okay, do whatever, you know, the, you know, click some command on your keyboard, search, uh, whatever it's, uh, the first thing that people do is they just use the search the public database. Next, uh, I to show them epigenetics, you know, the, just search uh, this uh, database to see whatever your gene was finding happened to be in a methylation site, you know, histone modification site, etc. Yeah, these are, you know, the uh, several uh, databases from uh, uh, NIH, whatever this, uh, you know, the NLM, National Library for Medicine. This is GTEx. This is, uh, you know, the very important one. They are doing checking the EQTL, expression quantitative trade loci, checking the association between a uh, uh, marked genotype and the gene expression level. Right now, they only have an RNA expansion from 48 tissues, from a 680 donor. And in the near future, they are going to 
uh, external not just the EQTR, they are going to have a DNI accessibility, mass selection, a mass selection EQTR, and then they are going to, uh, mm, how we can they dramatically increase the sample size? You know, the, it's because, you know, the waiting for people die, you know, the, then give up the tissue, actually it's very hard. So these are, the, you know, the, some uh, EQTL uh, database focused on particular tissue, like blood, brainiac, the brain, common mind, the brain, brain, brain. You know, this is uh, actually, you know, the, also from multiple tissue, so from European. Right now, I, they don't have uh, many donors over there, just uh, waiting for more donors to expand. Uh, yeah, actually, you know, the, I mean, you know, the, if you have, uh, you know, the uh, disease tissue, you know, the, if you, uh, for example, you know, the, uh, from cancer, it's very easy to get. The particular hard ones are from brain. People don't want to give up their brain. And, you know, the collect people, collect brain tissue from, you know, people dying, it's very hard. You have to have people you know, waiting there, you know. You don't know when they will die. It costs tons of money. It's, a, it's a very hard to claim. Of course, you know, the, if they have, have a, you know, the, we, we, in our alcohol disease, you know, the, we collect a sample from people uh, died from a car accident. But in that way, you know, that brain tissue had to be <laughs> intact, not, you know, the destroyed. So it's a very, very hard. So this is, uh, you know, the, beyond just the simple search of the public database, you can do some actual statistical analysis. So the, the first one is, you know, the uh, summary data based on Mendelian uh, randomization. So this is a paper, you know, if you are interested. So the, the idea is, you know, the, okay, I have a GWAS finding, this is my SNP. You know, the, okay, this finding, I also find, you know, this SNP is the equal to of this uh, whatever transcription, this gene. So how do I know, you know, the, this variant, you know, the cause a different expression of this gene? Then the different expression causes the disease, not the, you know, the, what we call the pleiotropy or linkage. So this program is basically, you know, the try to different this one uh, from this tool. This is the one you really care. I'm not going to uh, details about this, just so you know, you know, the, there's a program over there, and then actually, you know, the, for almost every paper, if they can, you know, the, find EQDL, they are always, uh, you know, the, perform uh, this analysis. This is the, another one, they call the predict scan and the meta scan, the difference, you know, difference uh, between the two is uh, this one is a, uh, individual genotype data, this one only use the p-values and the effect. So this is how it works. I'm using an example, you know, from a predict scan, you have a genome. In your study, you have a genotype, you have a phenotype, you don't have experience data. And in public database, you know, that you have, they have a genotype data, they have expression, but they don't have phenotype data. So what you do is you do the, uh, this is the same principle as the imputation. So you have a genotype data. They also have a genotype data. So the assumption is that if they have same genotype data, they probably they have the same experience data. So based on the when you, when you compare the genotype, so you can impute their experience data. Then you, you are, in your data you have a genotype, phenotype, and uh, imputed uh, experience data. Then you can do the same thing, you know, the do association between phenotype and expression. This is again, you know, the, for your paper, you know, if you want to uh, do some uh, uh, EQTL analysis, you, you should have either whatever uh, study like similar like to SMR or this uh, predict scan. So, uh, okay, I have five minutes. Less than five minutes. So, uh, so uh, all I talked before, we focused on, you know, the particular variants uh, or genes or pathway. This one is really talking about all variants, all genes in the entire genome. It's called a polygenic risk score. 
for this one, you know, the, actually, you know, the, uh, two, three months ago, you know, the, nobody believed this one, you know, the will work. Then, I don't remember, you know, maybe July or something, that's a natural genetic paper. They successfully used the polygenic risk score, you know, the, uh, applied to this uh, general population. Then, identifying, you know, the, this high risk population. So, those people have a higher polygenic risk score, have a three times uh, higher, the, you know, the probability to get a cardiovascular disease. This is actually, you know, the pretty striking. And then, you know, the for that paper, Nature Genetics put an edit, uh, you know, the, have an editorial about that, have a news about that. And then just yesterday, another paper from Nature, you know, the, they also successfully use PRS to predict disease. So that's the reason, you know, the you know, say, okay, so even, you know, the, this is uh, still in its infancy, you know, then you have to talk about this. This idea is, uh, you know, the, from this position, personal medicine. Okay, you know, the, I have a, uh, a G1, uh, whatever, genotyping of somebody. So can I uh, say, you know, okay, you, uh, what percentage I'm going to get this disease? So for mundane disease, it's very successful because the disease has a very large effect. So, you know, the, if you have that mutation, most likely you are going to have that disease. For complex trait, the success stories, you know, just focus on like the LAC2 gene for the Parkinson's disease and the APO5 for the Alzheimer's disease. And then, you know, the, for those whatever tens of thousands of GWAS results in that uh, online database, you know, the, 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 you know, the totally useless, you know, in clinical application. So that's the reason, you know, they want to to you know, just check, you know, whatever GWAS results uh, in, you know, the entire GWAS results, whole genome, so they put that called polygenic risk score, and the problem is they call it uh, genome-wide genetic polygenic risk score, or GPS, not the global precision system. Okay. Yes, yeah, so this is, you know, the, how it works, you know, the, so you have a discovery data set, you have a target data set. For your discovery data set, you have a p-value and an effect, bunch of SNPs, whole genome, and the same bunch of SNPs in your target data set. You have person one, person two, person three. And the first one, you know, the, you just, uh, whatever, try to include the SNPs. Uh, probably you saying, okay, I just want to have SNPs with a p-value less than 0.25. So this SNP is gone. And this space is not going to be used. And like you know, I said before, in you know, the SNP has in LD, maybe these two SNP are in LD, so I only keep the most significant one. So this is gone, this is gone. Then you just use you know, the all SNPs left to calculate this uh, uh, PRS. So for each individual, you have you know, the PRS score. And of course, they have their phenotype or trait. Then you just perform a, a simple, you know, the association. You know, if the people with a high PRS score have, a, you know, the uh, have some, you know, particular trait, then you know the you you have how some significant. Huh? Can you go back to the previous slide? How the effect? Based on your, uh, if you are doing a linear regression. Just say Yeah, just beta. If you are doing uh, you know, the binary analysis, you, know, you, will, you will have all the ratio. And you add up them together. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, first you uh, time whatever number of copies, uh, times your genotypes. You know, zero copy, one copy of a minor allele, correlated with an effect site, and add them together. So that's the reason, you know, why each person only get one PRS, one polygenic score. Yeah. And actually, you know, the people now are thinking about not only use the effect sign, probably, you know, the we can use, okay, we can only use, you know, the uh, whatever those uh, SNPs and are EQTL for particular tissue. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, these two papers really, you know, the really, they, they are really the game changer. Yeah. 
Actually, you know, the two or three months ago, you know, people are worried about, you know, where should we go with this genetic analysis? So everything seems routine, you know, the, every time we present a, a result, you know, the two uh, people, if there's a clinician over there, they're always asking, okay, you give me p-value, you know, the minus 30 and minus 40. So what can I do? What can I tell my patient? So then this is uh, really, uh, if you have a high, high risk for some disease, probably you are in high risk. You should do some whatever right thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm running out of time. Yeah. If you have questions, you can come to me. And then if you have to go, you are free to go now. Well, thank you very much. It looks good. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? I guess you can ask the private way. And I have to say that all the material that being covered today will be in the exam. Okay? So if you haven't gotten fully the point, you either email him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or you have to study the, the course material uh, uh, harder. Okay? Okay, please do email me. All right.